Peterborough Trust webinar. Um, we'll just wait a few moments whilst everyone logs on and we've got a few early starters. Very good to see you all joining in. We've got people coming in tonight from all around the world, from Nagaland, of course, um, from lots of countries. So that's fabulous news. And we've got people joining us as well whose uh, grandparents and forebears fought in Burma um, and, and also in India. And it's really, really good to have you all on board tonight. There are some very uh, distinguished guests joining us. So that's really exciting as well. Um, we've got about 160 people planning to log in tonight. Um, and it's, uh, it's good to see some newcomers. Welcome to all of some Ireland. That's fabulous. You're not too far away. And, um, and welcome, of course, to uh, everyone who's uh, all those, and there are a few who are joining this KET webinar thing which we've got going uh, for the first time. We're really excited by this program, actually. It uh, takes a lot of effort, but uh, it's really exciting. And uh, we're making new friends as we go uh, all over the world. And uh, we're able to get the story of the um, Kahima campaign, the, the whole Burma campaign uh, out there. And it's really, really good news. Um, so let's just wait a few more minutes till we're ready to, uh, to hand over to Sylvia and then we'll start properly, but um, just settle in, make sure you've got a glass or something convivial to help you through. I won't be doing that, I'm afraid. I have to keep my wits about me for this audience, but um, I hope you enjoy what we've got for you tonight. Uh, I see lots, of, lots more people coming in. We've got a very strong Irish contingent tonight. That's very exciting. Very good. Uh, nice to see John coming up from Padstow. John took me around Burma many years ago. Thank you, John, for that. That was quite an extraordinary uh, journey around um, around Burma with you. Yeah, lots of lots of friends joining us. That's fabulous. And thank you very much for those kind comments about uh, Chalk Valley. What a fabulous week that was. I'd love when I'm a grown up to be able to go there every day. I was invited for one day, but uh, I'm glad the uh, the talk went down well and you enjoyed it. And we're whilst we're waiting, we're also uh, looking forward to uh, people coming up to York next week. I think this is Sylvia telling me to stop talking. Sylvia May, over to you. Oh, thanks, Rob. And hello, everybody. So nice to see you all. Well, you can see us. We can't actually see you. But welcome back to another KET webinar. Some of you just were commenting that the sound wasn't great. If it still isn't, can you um, let us know, please? But it's so particularly wonderful to welcome um, so many people again tonight. And we've got a lot of new names, which is terrific, as well as our faithful regulars to whom I send a specific thank you. And I'd like a particular mention and shout out, go to Nick and Sarah Heymendorf, who um, uh, are joining us for the first time, which is wonderful and lots of friends from Nagaland. A special mention also to Nicolette Stevens, who, um, whose uncle fought with the Kachins and stayed with them in Burma after the war was over. So tonight, military historian, for those of you that don't know him, and author, Dr. Robert Lyman, can't be many out there that don't know you by now, Rob, is going to discuss the role of the Indian and Burmese hill tribes in the war against Japan. He will explain the various tribes, examine their motivations and outline what they undertook to do, often at great risk to themselves in the war against the Japanese. During the four to five years that the Second World War lasted in Burma, the various people of the hills around Burma's periphery, the Nagas, the Kachins, Karens, Chins, Rohingyas, did much to support the Allied war effort. Indeed, without the direct support of many of these people, the war would have been much more difficult to win. Do feel free to ask questions either on the chat or the Q&A button. We won't get to them until the end, but we will endeavour to answer them at the end. Should we be unable to do so tonight, we will certainly follow up with an email. And inevitably, should that internet connection let us down, we will do everything we can to be back up online as soon as possible. 
Now, over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for that very kind introduction. Let me just share my screen and uh, we should be ready to roll. If uh, you nod your head, Sylvia, I know that you can see it. Fabulous. Well, as Sylvia says, I mean, the, the war in the Far East is, is often a war that we don't really uh, know much about in terms of the indigenous population. And for many years, I've been concerned that those who study the war have a need to have a greater understanding of the indigenous populations. And of course, we're talking about populations across India and Burma, and these are all quite complicated. So I'm delighted to be able to uh, present this, uh, this conversation with you tonight. Um, so I want to talk about the hill tribes, as Sylvia said, those people who lived in the mountainous periphery of Burma and who contributed significantly to the allied war effort during the Second World War, and of course, to its success. Uh, and as I said in my introduction, it really is good to have so many people from across the world with us tonight. I see Australia pop up, uh, including folk whose family fought in Kachin territory in Burma, as well as those in the Naga Hills. So tonight I'll briefly explain who these tribes were, their motivations, and describe something of what they did. I hope to give you a sense of just how considerable was the work that they did during the war, voluntarily and often in the face of great personal danger, to ensure the defeat of the Japanese. And I'm going to look at each of the hill tribes in turn. It won't be long, I'm afraid. We don't have uh, a huge amount of time tonight, but I'm going to start with the ones that encountered the Japanese first. And we'll look briefly at what happened in 1942 before finally looking at the role two of the hill tribes in particular played in the final stages of the war. And I'm not going to spend time explaining the campaign. Um, you all ought to know that by now. If you do want to understand a little bit more then can I suggest you go back to one of the earlier presentations uh, where we cover that in, in some detail. So let's start by looking at the ethnic geography of Burma. And this slide shows it well. Burma was and remains a patchwork of diverse eth ethno eth ethnic um, groupings, each of which represents a range of backgrounds, cultural heritage and histories. Uh, these people have coexisted in and around the fringes of Burma for centuries and include, as Sylvia said at the outset, the Mon, the Karen, the Shan, the Kachin, the Naga and the Chin peoples, amongst others. Along the Arakan littoral in the west reside the Rohingya, people of the Islamic faith who have traveled along the coastline from further north in modern day Bangladesh, what was Bengal. Now, right in the center of Burma, denoted by the great swathe of white you can see on the map, lived the traditional Burmans, the Burma of the Burman, Burma Plains, often called the Irrawaddy Delta. Traditionally farmers, they're also Buddhist. Now the people of the hill tribes, agriculturalist in the main, but also occupiers of land with great mineral wealth, have traditionally been animists. Although early converts to Christian missionaries in the 19th century, especially amongst the Karens in the Southeast and the Nagas in the Northwest. Perhaps 60% of Burma's pre-war population of 17 million were Burmars, and 40% belonged to the various hill tribes. The Burmars were concentrated in the center with major towns on Burma's mighty rivers, the Satang, the Irrawaddy, and the Chindwin. Now, historically, the Burma and the people of the hill tribes have coexisted, but often uneasily. For instance, the kings of the Shan states paid tribute to the Burmese, Burmese king, but they were not ruled directly by them. The further one went into the hill country, the less effective Burma governance was. For instance, in the far north, in the Hukan Valley, in the far northeast, uh, the area, an area which China had long held a territorial claim, Burma authority stopped at the principal town of Michinar. Even under British rule, which began in 1885, the first administrative expedition into the Hukan Valley didn't take place actually until eight, uh, 1926. Now, the British had a policy of tribal administration, not just in Burma, but in neighboring northeastern India, of allowing the tribes to get on with their lives with the minimum of fuss, so long as they followed some very simple rules. Raiding, theft and murder were forbidden. But for the most part, tribal laws and customs, as they differed among the peoples, were not just allowed, but in fact encouraged. 
For the most part, low-level crimes were dealt with by tri tribal elders, but regular visitations by traveling magistrates dealt with serious crimes such as murder. The primary virtue of the British colonial administration, so far as the tribes were concerned, was the protection afforded to all the villages by locally recruited paramilitary policemen, like the Assam Rifles and the Burma Rifles, which we'll talk about later, enforcing the injunctions against attacking each other and protecting the ability of villages to trade without let or hindrance. Endemic insecurity was a significant feature of tribal life for centuries, especially in the Naga territories, where headhunting was such a pronounced characteristic of the military and spiritual culture of the Naga tribes. Indeed, a feature of British administration in the Naga Hills during the 1920s and 30s, as you will know from my talk on Panksha, was the reluctance of the British deputy commissioners to intervene in village disputes, even those associated with headhunting, unless some grievous offence against the public peace had been committed. This policy of what perhaps I call benevolent administration, associated with the impartial application of the rule of law, was probably the most significant characteristic of the British colonial period, remembered as such by the tribal people today, and a significant reason for the largely harmonious relationships between the British and the people of the Hill Tribes with which there was an interaction, administrative otherwise, before the war. It was this set of positive relationships that meant that when the Japanese invaded in early 1942 and upset the tribal apple cart, tribal affections were overwhelmingly antagonistic towards the Japanese and where it were possible to continue to provide support to the British and the allies more generally. Now let's look specifically at Burma. Before the war, the positive relationships between the colonial authorities and the people of the Hill Tribes could be seen in the recruitment to the Burma Army. Regiments of the army had been raised during the Great War, originally composed of Burmans, Karens, Kachins and Chins, with some domiciled Gurkhas. Despite the protests of experienced officers, the recruitment of Burmans was stopped in 1927. The rationale was that the Burmese didn't make good soldiers, but in fact, the failure to recruit Burmans alienated the army from the Burma, the Burma rather, population, which saw it as just another part of the occupying British forces, rather than something specifically Burmese. When Burma separated from India in 1937, these Burma army battalions, four of them became number four, number one to number four battalions of the Burma Rifles. The battalions themselves were organized into four rifle companies, and between 1923 and 1937, two companies in each battalion were com composed of Karens and one each of Chins and Kachins. And it's important really just to bear this in mind as we consider the role of the Hill tribes in Burma. The Burma army itself, by the, the outset of the war, was essentially Karen, Kachin, and Chin, not Burma. Now let's look specifically now briefly at the Karen. The Karen people, as I suggested at the outset, have always had an uneasy relationship with the Burma and were very early supporters of the British when they arrived. They saw the arrival of, the, of British influence as a means of reducing Burma pressure on themselves. After the Japanese invasion in 1942, a Burmese nationalist army under Aung San supporting the Japanese immediately began to exercise traditional Burma animosities against the Karen, animosities that had largely been suppressed during the 56 years of British rule, with the result that many Karens felt alienated and repressed. In the long term, they became natural allies of the British in 1944-1945 as allied fortunes began to improve. More on that later. In addition, Many members of the Burma Rifles were sent home to their villages and told to await the British return when the Japanese successfully ejected the, the British from Burma in May 1942. One of their leaders, shown here, Captain Hugh Seagram, remained in the hills until he was forced to surrender in March 1944. He was executed by the Japanese in September 1944 in an act of remarkable courage as he surrendered himself to prevent further Japanese depredations 
against his Karen friends. In a quite remarkable way, the Karens remembered this loyalty and rose up in support of the British at the start of the following year. Now, far to the north in the valleys north and northeast, northwest rather, of Michinar is Kachin territory. The British, like the Vermont before them, largely left the Hukin Valley alone. And when the Japanese invaded, they captured Michinar, one of the last transit points for refugees flying or walking out of Burma in May 1942. The walking routes, you'll see these in a moment on a map by the Chalkan Pass or the Panksal Pass, were utterly terrible and saw the death of many hundreds, perhaps thousands of refugees in 1942. At the most northern point of the Hukin Valley, if you can see my cursor up here, is Fort Hearst. Fort Hertz. Until 1942, Fort Hertz was maintained as an outpost of the Michinar Battalion of the Burma Frontier Force, separate to the army. During 1942, various retreating soldiers of the British and Indian Burma garrison remained here in the Fort Hertz area. The military authorities in India didn't actually have a direct contact with Fort, Fort Hertz during most of the summer of 1942. Its garrison consisting of part of a battalion of the Indian Army and a newly recruited guerrilla force called the North Cachin Levies formed an isolated northern post in Burma throughout the duration of the Japanese occupation of the country. And with the assistance of Kachin irregulars, the route north from Japanese held Burma to Fort Hertz was defended against a series of attacks in 1942 and 1943. And uh, one of my friends in the Japanese War College has said that the 18th Division, in fact, didn't get any further north um, uh, along the Hukin Valley than Sampabon. In 1943 and 1944, the primary purpose of Fort Hertz was to gather intelligence and to cover an airstrip which served as an emergency landing ground for the planes flying the hump from India, the northern Brahmaputra and Assam to China over the eastern end of the Himalayas. And this same airstrip was the only supply line for Fort Hertz. There was also eventually a radio uh, beacon navigation point at the site as well. Let's move on from the Kachins and introduce you to uh, people who you will not need any introduction to. And these wonderful photographs uh, brilliantly portraying the Nagas in the 1930s were taken by the late Christoph von Führer Harmendorf. And they really are extraordinary. And if you have an opportunity, do have a look at them uh, online uh, in the Cambridge archives uh, established by our friend, uh, Alan McFarlane. Well, with the prospect of war in 1942, a plan was launched to recruit a force of Naga volunteers, especially those who lived in the hills alongside the Chinwin, which was known as V-Force from Plan 5, um, in India Command, not village force, as some have supposed, in order to work with the Assam rifles to protect the forward reaches of Manipur and Assam against the policy of Japanese encroachment against India. Now, I've given a separate talk on the subject of V-Force, which is available via the Kahima Educational Trust website, but a couple of points should be made here. The first is that V-Force had no shortage of volunteers. Not all hill people in Manipur and Assam were well inclined towards the authorities. A number of Kuki villages had long lived in a state of restlessness uh, and were less inclined to support the British than the Nagas were. In the event when the Japanese did invade in 1944, several Kuki villages sided with the Japanese. But on the whole, the network of Naga and many Kuki villages along the Chinwin offered a comprehensive defense of the eastern edge of India in what was known locally as a watch and ward operation. In time, rifles and ammunition were also provided, but the primary task of V-Force was to provide information about possible Japanese movements through the hills. In time, a patchwork of V-Force networks was established over a length of territory that stretched for over a thousand miles. That's the equivalent distance from London to Warsaw. Now, a very significant feature of Naga support for the defense of the hills lay with the quality of the deputy commissioners. And you'll know this if you've um, been able to read 
uh, my book, Among the Headhunters. One such was the remarkable Charles Palsy. Uh, through the height of the Japanese invasion of India, the Nagas of Imphal and Kahima remained loyal to the British in the main. And Naga loyalty was a product primarily of the determination of Charles Palsy to remain in Kahima during the siege and with the other deputy commissioners to ensure the Naga refugees in the hills were provided with food and medicine at an assembly point um, uh, away from the battle. And in, in Kahima's case, it was just outside Joksima. Another remarkable uh, individual, not a um, deputy commissioner, of course, was Ursula Graham Bauer. She was an anthropologist who first went to Assam in 1939 uh, to study the Naga people. And she joined V Force based in Lao Song in September uh, 1942, this uh, dark blue patch, if you can see it just to the left of um, the number three V Force group in Manipur. And she successfully operated a watch and ward program for the next two years, including during the height of the Japanese offensive, Operation Ugo in 1944. Now, forward of Imphal, eight platoons of V Force and the Assam rifles patrolled the Chindwin River Valley, 100 miles forward of Imphal. V Force became increasingly involved in combat actions especially when the Japanese attempted to attack their forward bases. But the Japanese at the time were pushing long range patrols into Manipur in order to undertake reconnaissance of the approach routes for Mutaguchi's Operation U, uh, Ugo, Operation C, the invasion of, of India, which was due to start in the following March, March, 1944. They needed to remove as many of the V force bases as they could. And the action at Manpur is one that I've chosen because it's represented uh, uh, representative of many. You can see uh, Manpa, if you can see my cursor, on the Chindwin, uh, on this, um, this screenshot from Google Maps or Google Earth, with the, uh, the hills to the left of them. And I'll read it out for those who don't have sight of it. In a surprise attack at 3.30 in the morning on the V-Force post at Manpa, the enemy quickly made a gap in the perimeter and four Japanese made for the wireless station. They already had a wireless they already had the wireless in their hands when a Havildar, a corporal, and a rifleman killed all four with their cookeries. The attack went on for two hours, during which the Japanese continually attempted to rush the gap, but were driven off with Bren gun fire and hand grenades. The V Force commander, Lieutenant Godfrey, was wounded three times, but continued to take command until he received his fourth wound. This Japanese force was finally driven off at daylight, with many killed and wounded, at the cost of two killed and 11 wounded of the V-Force men. And the citation for the Indian Order of Merit for Sabadar Bindman Rai of the Assam Rifles gives a sense of the fighting at manpower, and it's worth just reading this out. And if you, as an aside, if you wanted to uh, further uh, interrogate these, um, these citations, they're freely available in the National Archives uh, website. On the 23rd of 7, 1943 at Manpa on the Upper Chindwin, when Sivadar Bindaraman Rai's position was attacked in the early hours of the morning by a force of 400 enemy. I suspect that's slightly exaggerated, but it's, uh, it's a significant enemy. It was largely due to the cool courage and magnificent leadership of this officer that his position, which was held by a platoon only, was not overrun and the platoon wiped out. In a series of three strong enemy attacks over a period of four hours, Sivadar Bindaraman Rai through his personal example and the skillful handling of his men, was able to beat off all enemy attacks, inflicting considerable casualties. Throughout the action, he displayed outstanding courage and devotion to duty, by which his own deeds was reflected in his men. After the enemy's final withdrawal, he took out a small reconnaissance patrol and maintained contact with the enemy until certain of their final withdrawal from the area, thereby assuring the safe evacuation of his wounded. This is quite extraordinary. This is a Burma rifles officer working with V force, um, far forward of, um, far, far to, in advance of, of Imphal and putting up a very, very spirited and successful defense of uh, his position. And it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable in many, many senses. Let's just move very briefly south of, uh, Manipur to the area of uh, the, the Chin Hills, 
Um, and these hills, as you can see on the map, form the southwestern boundary of Burma with India. Uh, also played a very significant part in keeping the Japanese out of the hills until 1944. And then thereafter, although we don't have time to talk about it tonight, um, in terms of offensive operations against the Japanese in 1945. During and after the general evacuation of Burma, evacuation rather of Burma in 1942, a force of irregular troops, later be known as the famous Chin Levies, was in the process of being formed. And there was also a regular Chin battalion in the area at the time. The tribal chiefs, fearful of Japanese retribution, asked the British administration to withdraw from the Chin Hills. In response, the British committed to supporting the Chins. The head of V-Force at the time, an extraordinary character called Brigadier Felix Williams, set out from Imphal with a small Gurkha escort on a 600 mile tour of the area. His arrival with stores and with the appearance of British planes overhead helped to persuade the Chins that the British weren't in fact running away. Williams told them that in time, planes and guns would be sent to their help. They were, and the Chins remained loyal. So this is the period from 1942 to 1943 where the Japanese uh, pushed the British out of Burma and a period of uh, consolidation took place in terms of understanding what the Japanese were attempting to do. And in terms of the British uh, working out the best ways of defending India, uh, North and uh, west of Burma in case the Japanese invaded. Let's now look at the final uh, period of the war. Uh, that period which followed the defeat of the Japanese in Manipur and Assam. There were four significant operations involving the people of the hill tribes uh, during this last final year. And we've time to look at two areas in a little bit of detail, the Kachin and the Karen, now that the Japanese had been pushed out of Naka territory. So the uh, Mutaguchi's Ugo invasion of um, India and in Imphal and Kahima is now over. His 15th army has been defeated and has been pushed back across the Chinwin. And the 14th army is now looking uh, at how to take active offensive operations against the Japanese in Burma. Well, first, in the far north, where the Americans were building a new Burma road to China via Lido in northern Assam, men of the North Cajun levies, some 800 of them in 1943, slowly began to push the Japanese 18th Division out of the region. And this resulted in uh, August 1944 with the final battle for Michinar, which ended in August 1944. This really was a combined effort, in fact. Um, the uh, operation in the north was uh, organized by the Northern Combat Area Command, first of all, under the command of General Vinegar Joe Stilwell, a very famous American. And it comprised Cajun irregulars, so what the British uh, often called levies, the North Cajun levies, uh, regular American troops. Um, regular Kachin uh, troops known as the Kachin Rangers, um, who were very highly trained individuals sent to support American troops in reconnaissance and ambush tasks. And then two Chinese armies, the 22nd Chinese Army and the 38th Chinese Army, uh, which had been trained in India by British instructors, paid for by the British taxpayer, um, delivered to India via the hub. It was quite an extraordinary story. Uh, these armies specifically designed to work with the Northern Combat Area Command uh, to remove the, the Japanese from the Hukan Valley and to capture Michinar and therefore open up the second uh, Burma Road from Lido. And the, just so that you will know, the 5307 Provisional uh, Force, uh, known as Galahad Force or Merrill's Marauders, comprised about 3,000 men. And this map hopefully will make sense of the entirety of the NCAC area. You'll recall the map that I showed you earlier going up to Fort Hertz. Well, these were the two uh, ingress or offense, uh, offensive routes down to Michinar, which you can see in the star uh, down here. And for most of, starting in, at the end of 1942, the uh, Americans began to bulldoze their route across the 
um, Paktoi ranges across Pangshar Pass and down into Burma, and then through Burma itself, pushing the 18th Division ahead of them. And of course, as the Japanese were pushed back down here, they were uh, attacked uh, at Mogong and defeated in Mogong in June 1944 by the remnants of the Chindit force, um, led very courageously by Joe Lintain. Wingate, the Chindit commander, had died in February in an air crash. So that's the story of the, uh, the, uh, the NCAC approach down into northern um, Burma, down to Michinar. Now, I've got a fabulous, although silent, I'm afraid, um, clip of Kachin troops in the Shan states east, east of Michinar in early 1945. And we'll just look at this. In the first part of the clip, you'll be able to see something of the topography. Um, of the area, the hilly area uh, to the east of Michinar. You'll then see Kachin troops training with American supplied weapons, which is fascinating in itself. And we finally see some marvelous shots of low level airdrops from C 47s, the ubiquitous Dakota, as it was described in British terms. So here we are. Hopefully, you can see this coming up, uh, sadly, without any sound. Now, wasn't that marvellous? It's, uh, it's, I've struggled to work out whether they were Kachin levies and therefore under British command uh, and tra uh, trained by the British initially before um, coming under American command or Kachin rangers. I think they are Kachin levies because they're taught to salute in the British fashion, not the American. Anyway, that's just a guess by me. But it's very rare to get some, uh, to, to find cinematography like that from the war. Well, um, in the Karen Hills, coming back down to the southeast, uh, known as the Kareni, the area where Hugh Seagram operated until his capture in March 1944, an operation of the greatest strategic importance took place in early 1945. This was known as Operation Character. The real challenge for um, Bill Slim, who was the commander of the 14th Army, was how to get from uh, Mandalay 
which he had seized in um, March 1945, to Rangoon, a distance of about 800 miles, sorry, a distance of 400 miles, uh, before the rains came in March, in, in May. And the big challenge was the fact that at the time, Bill Slim didn't have enough fuel to support the drive south of his two corps. He had an armoured corps, the 4th Armoured Corps and the 33rd Corps, both Indian corps. So he sent the 4th Corps south uh, along the, the main road and the river link down via Tungu. And the problem with Tungu was that if the Japanese were able to get to Tungu first and to defend it, then there was a very good chance that the 4th Indian Corps would not be able to break through and make their way down to Rangoon with quite significant strategic, um, uh, a st significant strategic impact on Slim's plans. It would basically mean that Burma would not be captured before the rains fell. And the amphibious operation that was planned to strike against Rangoon uh, in May would need to take place uh, when it was, um, uh, when the Japanese were in the city and therefore opposed. So an amphibious uh, operation against Rangoon with a Japanese opposition in the middle of the monsoon wasn't something that Bill Slim was happy to consider. So what he needed to do was he needed to make sure that he was able to get his troops down to Tungu to occupy Tungu before the Japanese got there. And the only resources that he had to hand, I say only because these were actually turned out to be quite dramatically successful and effective forces, were the Karen levies or Karen guerrillas trained by members of the Special Operations Executive Force 136, as, as it was known, in the Kareni, in the Karen Hills. Um, this was a really, really significant operation, and it proved to be one of the most strategic of the war. In fact, I would go so far as to say that actually in the operations that were undertaken in the Kareni in March and April 1945, these were more significant strategically than the operations of the Chindits the previous year in Operation Thursday and the year before that in 1943. You can see Tungu, I hope, with my cursor here. Uh, the yellow denotes the locations of Japanese and Burma Defense Army troops, that's uh, Aung San's um, Burmese army, and the importance of being able to get down to Tungu to capture it to enable the drive to Rangoon to take place. Now, as I said, the task of raising the Karen levies was given to Force 136 and 110 British officers and non-commissioned officers and over 100 soldiers were mobilized to themselves train about 12,000 Karens over an area as much as 7,000 square miles. And at the same time, about 3,000 weapons were dropped to the Karens to enable them to take on this remarkable task. And during uh, March and April 1945, these 14,000 Karens harried the 50,000 Japanese moving uh, east and south towards Tungu, directing airstrikes, providing close reconnaissance of targets, and ambushing Japanese troops across the hills. The reality is if General Kimura, who is the commander of the Burma Area Army, had kept Tungu, he wouldn't have had to evacuate Rangoon, and Operation Dracula, as I suggested, would have been opposed and therefore uh, difficult uh, in the extreme. Well, in the event, uh, Operation Character killed 11,874 Japanese, far more, in fact, than those killed by the soldiers of 4 and 33 Corps, i.e. the conventional army. And it was a classic case of what could be done with irregular forces in conjunction with a conventional plan. And this particular picture you can see today, only uh, to tonight, only arrived in my inbox today, and it's the painting of a, uh, of a Karen ambush on the Mortuary Road for a book by me on the 1945 campaign, which will be published by Osprey next year. So you're very privileged to get an early sight of this. And then the, the final report on Operation Character is very interesting. It says that it achieved dramatic operational effect at a low cost in terms of men and equipment by helping to protect the flank of Slim's 14th Army as it advanced into southern Burma. By raising the local Karen population and operating in difficult terrain, the character teams assisted regular forces by inflicting significant casualties upon the Japanese as well as psychological damage.
quite remarkable actually for a um, unconventional forces working in conjunction with the conventional army to defeat the enemy. And it's very interesting when you consider the, the overall effect of uh, the conversation in strategy around the use of special forces that this is an occasion when it was very, very successfully achieved. Well, let's now draw to a close or towards a close. What conclusions can we reach from this brief excursion through the hill tribes during the war? Well, first, the very significant contribution made by various hill tribes during the Japanese invasion of 1942 through Karen, Kichin, Naga and Chin territories. Despite the enormity of the war that enveloped them, most tribes people remained loyal to the prospect of a return to British rule. And this was particularly true of the period through to mid-1944, when there was very little evidence of the massive transformation that was even then taking place in the Allied war effort, but which would, wouldn't be seen until the defeat of Mutaguchi at Imphal and Kahima. And my point here is that it's quite remarkable securing loyalty from friends and allies before the war during an offensive when actually no one can predict what the ultimate outcome is going to be like. And the comparison I normally make is with the studies that I've undertaken of the resistance in France, where in fact the dramatic um, upsurge in resistance activity only really took place in 1944 with the imminent prospect of um, the Allied invasion of Normandy. That's the first point, very significant contribution by um, tribes who had no expectation that the Allies would ultimately win, but remained loyal to the British in particular. Second, the very significant military contribution, contribution rather made to the fighting by the tribes people with no prospect of reward by Kachin, Naga, Chin and Karen, among others. Not only did these people volunteer to support the Allies, but they also actively contributed to the war by fighting against the Japanese. So it's one thing to um, be a, an observer of the fighting, another to support the Allies with food and so on, uh, and maybe patrols or intelligence and information. It's another to actively engage in the war fighting itself. And it's a very distinctive characteristic of the fighting in Burma. And as a result, the Allies were and remained very deeply in the debt of all those who fought alongside them in Burma and India in the Second World War. In fact, we, in fact, let's just um, look at these words of General Bill Slim. Now these, these words uh, in Bill, of Bill Slim actually uh, relate to the Nagas, but um, I'm, pretty certain that were he given the opportunity, he'd say the same about the Karens, the Chins, the Kachins and Shan as well. These were the gallant Nagas whose loyalty, even in the most depressing times of the invasion in 42, had never faltered. Despite floggings, torture, execution, the burnings of their villages, they refused to aid the Japanese in any way or to betray our troops. They guided our columns, they collected information, they ambushed enemy patrols, carried our supplies and brought in our wounded under the heaviest fire. And then being the gentlemen they were, often refused all payment. Many a British and Indian soldier owes his life to the naked headhunting Naga. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you get the point. And no soldier of the 14th army who met them will ever think of them, but with admiration and affection. Uh, we in the KET, of course, are profoundly, profoundly agree with that sentiment. Indeed, the very rationale for the establishment of the trust in 2004 was to pay tribute to the Nagas who had so overwhelmingly assisted the troops in the fight at Kahima in 1944. The friendship between the troops and the Naga people in 1944 is reflected in our commitment to the people of Nagaland today. Well, that's all from me. It's been a little bit shorter than I expected, but I think you're probably happy with that. It's now time to hand you back to Sylvia. We've got plenty of time for questions if there are any. Well, thank you, Rob, for another um, 
uh, scintillating and masterclass in presentations. Thank you very much. And I'm sure everyone will join me in knowing, learning new things that we haven't known before. Now, have we, we've got some questions, I think. Um, let's just have a look. Um, George Wilton. Hello, George. Um, was yoke force made up of the two India trained Chinese armies and KCLs? Uh, yes, uh, George, I'll have to go back and have a look at the details. But yes, yoke was a combination of them all. And that's one of the characteristics of the NCAC in total, way back up, way up in the um, um, Hukan Valley, uh, full integration between the Kachin levies, the Kachin rangers, um, Merrill's marauders and, uh, and the Chinese. Um, I see two people have raised their hands. Would you mind typing rather than um, we don't, I think, have the quite the facility to um, get you on screen? Um, but thank you. Um, somebody noticed a Lysander. Here's a question. Did the Karens and other Burmese tribes have any expectation like the Nagas of independence? Look, uh, that's a very good question. And actually, what I had done is not. I had some slides in to talk about independence and our friend Harry Fessett has actually written a really good article which you can find online on this. Um, I, there, is, there is no place officially where the British government promised independence to the Karens or the Kachins or anyone else in Burma. In fact, the, the ambition was to uh, take, well, there were two competing ambitions for those of, of you who have studied the subject between um, the Burmese authorities going back to take responsibility for Burma as a colony and more political uh, and more progressive soldiers who recognized that this was the end for the, for the British colonial endeavor in Burma and were very happy to give responsibility to the, the Burmese themselves, including Aung San during the fighting. Um, although it's important to note that there were almost certainly a number of British officers in the Karen states in particular, and I know this from talking to Charles J.C. and Kahima, that there were promises made to the Nagas in one part and the Karens in the other that Britain would not leave the uh, Karens and the Nagas respectively to their own devices. Um, they were promises that those individuals could not ever hope to, to meet, I'm afraid. And we all know that there's an, a, a degree of um, antipathy towards Britain and, and parts of Nagaland and the, and the Kareni that we, Britain, left uh, the those people to the tender mercies of uh, of the Burmese, the Burmars on one hand and the Indians on the other. It's a very sensitive and slightly complicated subject, but there were very significant debates in 1946 and 47 before uh, India and Burma got, uh, got their respective independence about the, um, the problem of allowing Nagaland in one, in one instance, the Naga Hills, not Nagaland 1961, but you know what I mean, the Naga Hills to retain its independence um, outside of India, because how could Britain support Nagaland on its own if it wasn't part of India? And likewise with Burma. It was a, for Britain at the time, it was a long answer to this question, it was a, an either an all in or all out proposition, a little bit like Britain and Ireland between 1919 and 1921, all in, or rule out, and the decision was made politically all out. Thanks, Rob. And then from Alan, did the Japanese treat the indigenous, the Nagas, etc., in a different way to that in which they treated the British? Yes, they did. Uh, on the whole, they treated the uh, Nagas well, um, although um, there are a number of instances of of significant mistreatment, in particular rape against uh, Nagas. And of course, the Japanese would often um, just take food. We do know that uh, in the Naga Hills and in, in between March, actually between April 1944 and, and August 1944, the Japanese attitude to the Nagas changed. And in the first few weeks of their invasion, they were interested only in finding accommodation and food. As this became uh, unavailable to them, they effectively turned nasty. Uh, it was very different to the Karens, of course, because the Karens exhibit a very strong uh, loyalty to Britain uh, right through the occupation, and they were treated very badly. There are a number of cases of 
very significant depredations by the Burma National Army against the Karens. A number of villages were burnt down and people were killed. Um, the Japanese, to, to give them their due, stopped that when they uh, had the opportunity. Um, uh, but the, the, the there's a very overall a very significant Japanese failure to bring the local tribes people on side. If you're going to invade Burma, uh, if I was going to invade Burma, the first thing I'd do is work out um, what I needed to do to bring the people of the this, this fractious civil state that had survived for 56 years under British colonial um, rule. Uh, the, the British, as I explained at the start, were, were pretty subtle about allowing the hill tribes just to continue doing their own thing. Um, and the hill tribes liked, liked them as a consequence. The Japanese didn't do anything of the kind. There was no sophisticated uh, politicking around what they needed to do and what they could do in Burma. I mean, arguably they didn't have time, but it was never in the Japanese inclination to do, to do anything. Thanks, Rob. And then from Nick Short, were any tribes in favor of the Japanese? The, the short answer is no, although some tribes did get on better with the Japanese than others. Uh, very interesting enough, the Kukis in uh, Manipur, um, a tribe uh, living in the hills long, alongside the Jinwen had risen up against the colonial authorities in the early 1920s. That, that uprising had been put down, but there was no love loss actually uh, between the Kukis and the uh, civil administration. And there was a sort of long going insurgency against the British um, which you will see, John, uh, when you come out to, um, or Nick, rather, when you come out to India with me next year. Um, in other parts of Burma, there was less of a Japanese influence because the Japanese were concerned with securing Burma, which is mainly the, um, the Satang, Irrawaddy and Chinwin valleys. Uh, the very significant part of um, Burma we haven't really mentioned are the Shan states, which are largely autonomous states with a great swathe of territory or uh, population merging into China. Uh, and the Japanese did very, very little in the Shan state. So it's very hard to determine their, their attitude to the Japanese and the Shan attitude to the, uh, to the Japanese. Um, John Hentcliffe, yes, you asked me about uh, John Headley. Well, in my latest book, I've used uh, John Headley's experiences of the early days of the war in January, February 1942 as part of the prologue to part one of the book. Um, quite an extraordinary uh, set of reminiscences. Of course, John Headley uh, was in the old um, Bombay Burma uh, company. Uh, he was uh, mobilized for war. He fought through 1942. He then fought through uh, the Chindit campaign in 1944 then came back and fought an SOE as well. He was personally known to Slim and whenever intelligence came out of the Karen Hills in 1945, Slim would ask who the intelligence came from and when he was told it was from John Headley, he said it's it's kosher, it's good. So a very, very interesting character. And Alan, Alan McFarlane, good evening. How lovely that you're here. I'm sorry I didn't mention you at the beginning. I should have. Um, Rob Allen's asking, do you believe Ursula's story of the stealing of the Japanese war maps is true? <laughs> I don't think it's true, but I've got no as a as I I've got no evidence to suggest otherwise. I mean, it just strikes me as a bit of a tall tale, really. Uh, the very interesting thing about Ursula, which you can never really get from either reading her book. So this is a bit of a nuanced point, folks, but reading a book or speaking to a daughter, Katrina and a child, or going to Lao Song is actually that uh, she was quite a long way, I, I hesitate to say this, quite a long way away from the, from the Japanese. So I think, I think no, Alan. And lastly, Van, welcome this evening. Thanks for joining us. Van is a, uh, from the Chin State, he lives in the UK now. And I suggest we put you in touch after the, after the webinar. Well, I've seen, the, I've seen the, the question, I'll just leap in. Your V-Force is different to the Chin Levies, um, Van. Um, the, the Chin Levies and the, um, the Chin Hills Battalion were different. And the V-Force, uh, there was a V-Force component in the Chin Hills, but it was a separate organization. It was set up in 1942 in order to be a watch and ward you know, of villagers, individuals and villagers who didn't have to sign up or get lots of weapons training, but who were able to report 
movements of Japanese in and out of the hills and, and they actually proved to be dramatically successful because if you're a Japanese soldier how do you know in a village who's reporting on you and who's not? And we've had some more come in. Judy Salmon, good evening. Um, he, she says that her father left Burma having been with V-Force. What would it have been like for the Burmese tribes? Were they seen as local heroes? Well, this is a really challenging point. Immediately after the war, no, they weren't seen as heroes. And I, I um, in due course, we'll do a lecture on or a talk on Aung San. Uh, the, the real challenge uh, in 1945 was securing a political leadership in Burma that recognised that a future Burma would only work if all the parties in the country, all the ethnic groupings, the Burma and the Hill tribes, actually came together with a single determination to, to achieve a new future. And that didn't happen. Aung San was one of the few men who had that vision of a united Burma. And of course, he was assassinated in 47 and therefore clearly wasn't able to to take Burma forward. In a very profound way, I suggest that the civil war that um, we find the, the Japanese reigniting in 1942 is the same civil war that we see in Myanmar today. Thank you, Rob. And then from um, Ying Hong Cheng, have you come across any materials regarding the relationship between African American soldiers who were building the Burma Road and Naga or other ethnic minority people in North Burma? Do you have any observations? What an absolutely fabulous question. Well, all I, will, I, I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen anything, Ying Hong, but I would imagine that material does exist. The American um, archives, actually, there's a lot of stuff on the NCAC. There are a lot of personal accounts, a lot of Americans went into print after the war. Um, and a lot of the stuff we know about the Kachin levies and the Kachin rangers come from the memoirs of um, men who were there. But I, I haven't seen anything specifically uh, about um, that subject, although it will exist. And the reality, just to remind people, uh, if you don't know, I mean, one of the, um, the forgotten facts of the, uh, the war in the Far East is how many Americans were actually in Southeast Asia Command. In April 1945, uh, there were 1.3 million men and women in Southeast Asia Command. That's the organization commanded by um, Admiral Lord Mountbatten. And of that number, uh, 272,000 were American. So th almost three times as many Americans as were Brits were in the SEAC, which is an extraordinary number. And they were, of course, building the road. They were supporting and sustaining the logistics up and uh, for the hump up the Brahmaputra Valley and also fighting in the NCAC. So I'm sorry, long answer to a, to a question. I'm sure the information does exist, but I haven't seen any of it. Um, and thank you, Harry. Um, I think we'll take this as the last question. Harry says you haven't mentioned the intelligence input of the Hill tribes, particularly the Karens in southern Burma. That may be a longer answer than you want to give on air. But well, Harry's absolutely right. I mean, I've and and Harry actually, incidentally, has written a very very good long article on the um, the Hill tribes in Burma. You can find it if you Google his name. And it's very well written, well presented, and um, and uh, you know I support it. Harry, all I've done tonight is bring in all of those aspects of war fighting, the intelligence gathering, and the long range patrols for for want of time. In fact, I realised I had more time than I need than I than I thought, so I could have introduced it. But it was for a general audience. You, of course, would do have done a much better job. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rob, and thanks for taking the time to answer all the many questions. If we haven't got to you all, we will answer um, over the next day or two. If you'd like to come and hear Rob speak live, um, he will be in York next Wednesday discussing his new book, War of Empires. Tickets are available from KET. And whilst I think we've closed the website to bookings, if you would like to come to the evening event to hear Rob, just email me. There are a small number of tickets still available at a very reasonable price of £15, which includes a glass of wine and some canapes afterwards. I know that many of you watching tonight are already booked for York next week, and we're looking forward hugely to seeing you there. Um, now we have, uh, do remember our shop, 
and um, we have lots of new items for sale with more arriving next week. All of Rob's books are also for sale here, along with beautifully made bags and shawls, all from Nagaland. And I always say, do remember, we are a charity. Um, the webinars are free to view and they are all available on our website. But if you enjoyed the talk tonight, or indeed any of them, please feel free to make a donation, um, which is easily done through our website. We're going to take a break now until September, but we've got three brilliant events lined up for the autumn, one in September, October and November, when Sangshak, Charles Pawsey and Tanks will be the three subjects under discussion. But thank you all very, very much for joining us tonight. I wish you good night. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Good night.